Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this exclusive Chief Executive Officer interview. My name is Richard Bruyère. I am managing partner at Indefi Strategy Consultants for the investment management business. Joining me today is Bas Nieuwevum. Good morning, Bas. How are you? Pretty impressive how you pronounce my last name. Uh, <laughs> I've sure. used my best Dutch accent. I've been practicing all morning, actually. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for uh, thank you for having us here, actually, today in the fantastic uh, recording studios of uh, Aegon Group. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, welcome taking up the challenge of this interview, where uh, our purpose is to uh, discuss some of the key trends that are uh, shaping up the uh, investment management industry. Exciting times for sure. <laughs> They are, <laughs> indeed. Um, when Actually, when the uh, I Empower organizations and we uh, thought about this uh, interview a few months ago, your name popped up quite naturally uh, and for a number of reasons. Uh, so uh, if I can give a few bit of introduction to uh, a background on your, on, on your profile, maybe. Um, you've been appointed Global Chief Executive Officer of Aegon AM uh, last year, last mm -hmm. June. So it's been a, about a year. And we felt that uh, in your new role, you'd be able to share maybe some, some fresh perspectives on what's happening in the market. Uh, you've also spent um, most of your career in the US and uh, working for large asset managers. And, and we felt that uh, having the double perspective of, uh, of US and Europe uh, would be uh, extremely uh, attractive for, uh, for, for, for this interview. And finally, You've already done, done a lot in your short stint as a head of Aegon, so you've set yourself an ambitious change agenda, and it's interesting to uh, learn more from it and, uh, mm -hmm. and understand how you lead in these uh, turbulent times. So um, I think for, for this interview, we, we'd like to um, talk about three main topics. Um, of course, I, need, I think we need to mention the pandemic and, and, and understand you know, how you guys have adapted to, to the situation. Um, but m more profoundly, I think more structurally to understand, you know, the changes in the investment management industry and how a firm like Aegon AM today can, you know, adapt and uh, still uh, be on a, a growing path. And finally, uh, a subject that is dear to your heart, you've been uh, known as a tree hugger <laughs> to some, is uh, sustainability, of yep. course, as the next new normal, for lack of a better word. Uh, in the investment management business. So, um, well, let's kick off, I think. Past 2020 has been a, a strange year by, by, for most, by most accounts. Um, has your, the organization fared? How, how do you manage to keep the engine running today? Yeah, so, so first of all, thank you uh, to IM Power and thank you, uh, Richard, to have me uh, here in the, in the interview. Uh, it has definitely been a, a, a very hectic first year for me, right, as a, a CEO of Aegon uh, Asset Management. Um, I had probably five, six months to, to travel around the world and meet my people, and then uh, we went in lockdown in, uh, in March. And um, it has been, uh, as for everybody that is uh, listening today, it has been an unbelievable time. And, sure. uh, but we have to uh, manage ourselves through it, and I'm, I'm very impressed, to be honest with you, how our entire asset management industry has done that. Um, if, if you would have asked me uh, if that, that 1,250 people at Aegon Asset Management can work from home and that we can get them to home in, in a two-week period and there is no trade errors and we can continue to deliver the alpha to our clients, I would have never said yes. But the reality is we did it. Great. Um, I think more, more, maybe more structurally, um, it's interesting to share some views on the on those you know, structural changes that are impacting the asset management industry. Um, and we all know that uh, you know, there are a number of trends, powerful trends that are shaping up the the opportunity, including you know the low yield environment, which has been around for years and years yeah. and uh, doesn't seem to be <laughs> reaching the end. Uh, more regulations, uh, sustainability. We mentioned that. Technology, I would add as well, yeah. in portfolio management, sales, client servicing. Um, how do you adapt a firm like Aegon AM today to these trends? Um, do you think there's still some future for players like you uh, in the competitive asset management space? Yeah, very fair question. Um, so I, I think it's the perfect storm against, against active asset management that we've seen in the last four or five years. And it's all started with the low yielding environment. Sure. Uh, as a result of that, uh, tremendous fee pressure for active management. As a result of that, or in conjunction with that, you know, index and passive wave taking over from, from active. And, and how does the active industry respond to that? 
and and there will be winners and losers. So I how think. do you do it? <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 you have seen a lot of consolidation in the industry. A lot sure. of a lot of big managers consolidated for, for this re region the, uh, reason because you need to have skill uh, in order to have the revenues to offset the higher costs in order to, 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 to keep certain margins that, that are expected. So how, how are we doing it at Aegon yeah, Asset Management? You, you have not bought, have you? You are not on an acquisition <coughs> path, unless I'm mistaken today. Th that's correct. Um, our, uh, my vision is that we first need to fix it internally before you can start thinking about something like that. Mm -hmm. So we had three brands. We, were, uh, we had investment teams in four different regions that were all separate. And we decided to consolidate all of that. And that's what we announced in February. And that is creating internal skill. So we have 400 billion in assets on the management, but it was not on the same uh, back office, same front office system, same risk management system. So we decided to play the skill game first internally okay. to bring everything together. And um, as a result of that, in this pandemic, it, because we announced that in February, in March we went into lockdown, True. we had to manage this entire globalization process in, in over the last six months from home. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> That's quite, a, yeah. quite, quite an achievement. Uh, what has been uh, completed is uh, we created one global management board, one global P&L, one global brand. So we, two weeks ago, we retired the, the former brands in the UK and the Netherlands. It's now Aegon Asset Management. Mm -hmm. We created four investment platforms with uh, each a CIO. And it is a global platform. So everybody who's touching a bond anywhere in the world is part of the global fixed income platform, to give you an example. So that has That's all been completed. Okay. But you're never done in this industry. <laughs> we mentioned uh, earlier on the, the low yield environment. Uh, and obviously, there's uh, one area of the market which is uh, red hot. It's yeah. uh, private assets. Uh, it's been the case for a few years. And you know, according to our analysis, it's not going to uh, change in the future, given the level of rates. Um, you guys are players in the private asset space. Mm -hmm. um, what is your uh, approach? What is your strategy there? And do you think you can, you know, find yourself a niche uh, in between, you know, the, you know, the global managers which are growing fast in that space, the global private asset platforms on the one hand, and the very niche specialists on the other hand? Yeah. Is there a so so? Our 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 vision is that you have to differentiate yourself from um, the passive managers. And, and therefore, you need to focus on distinct offerings that are not easily replicable. And that's how you get to the private asset classes. Yeah, typically. Right? Yeah. And, and, and uh, so we play in two areas, in, on the real asset space and in the in alternative fixed income space. And um, obviously, you've got a, an insurance heritage. <laughs> and we are here in the building of yeah. Aegon. So uh, we feel that pressure <laughs> very much. Um, is, is being affiliated to an insurance company today, in your view, a competitive advantage when it comes to private assets? Or on the other hand, does it prevent you from you know, innovating, being more nimble, because yeah. you're being constrained by, in some way or another, the, the general account investment objectives? Yeah. No, listen, there is pros and cons about everything in life. Uh, and as, as an asset manager being affiliated with an insurance and retirement company, there is, there is there's pros and cons as well. Let's be very honest about that. Yeah, so there's a couple of things that I think are a tremendous advantage of being part of a, a large insurance company. First of all, we have 125 billion of assets that we manage for them. That obviously keeps the lights on, right? It pays for the infrastructure. Yes. Uh, we're, we're able to, to have the best technology, the best front office systems. We use BlackRock Aladdin, for example. Our external clients will benefit from that. As an insurance company, you're typically a bottom-up fundamental credit research investor. We have a 55-people credit research team that we also offer to our external clients. Okay? Yeah. If we bring new products to the market, the insurance companies and the affiliates can a lot of times seed those clients, and you can be quick and fast to the market. External clients can come in. There's co-investment opportunities on the real asset side with, uh, for external clients. And that are all tremendous advantages of being part of an, in, uh, an insurance company as an asset manager. And on the disadvantage side, um, we've seen, uh, I don't know if that's the case here at Aegon, but we've seen a number of situations where affiliated managers to insurance companies, after a few years of expansion in private assets, came to a situation where actually, you know, the general, general account had invested and there were actually some constraints and the co-investment strategy of 
developing products for the general account and offering those products to third party asset managers was less effective. Don't you think that's a risk? I mean, do you, do you think um, that could at some point apply to, so, to you? So uh, uh, the investment horizon of an insurance company can always change. Uh, solvency sure. too, or risk-based capital yeah. uh, uh, requirements, RBIC uh, uh, requirements in the US, they will change. So um, that will always change over time. But I think we bring products to the market one by one. And if there is a, a, a great, if we see an investment opportunity where we believe we can generate alpha, and the insurance company is able to give us 200 million to get it up and running, we have a tremendous advantage against many of our competitors okay. who would love, who are dying to bring that to the market, but they don't sure. have that seat. Yeah. And then we bring external clients, we bring it. If, if in five years, the investment appetite of our insurance company will change, yeah, that will likely impact the type of product we bring to the market. So uh, product development becomes key, right? Product development is key in this, in this market. And that goes back to what you said earlier, uh, Richard, is, 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 is as an active manager, you need to be differentiating and you need to be distinct. So product development today is more important than ever before in our industry. Clear. One other aspect of this unfortunate COVID crisis is um, the rise and rise of sustainable investing. Um, you know, we, we did quite, quite a lot of research in that space over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Already, uh, you know, at the end of 2019, I think more than 50% of uh, institutional assets in Europe were managed under what we call the ESG considerations. So taking into account some form of exclusions or uh, applying stewardship to assets or um, obviously ESG integration or impact investing. Um, how do you think you can keep differentiating yourselves? Yeah. And differentiation is a strong you know, message that you want yeah. to... Uh, yeah, listen, this, this is a topic to our heart at Aegon Asset Management, right? Well, we, no doubt. <laughs> it's part that. of our... <laughs> responsible investing is part of our DNA. We have been doing this since 1989. We have a track record of 30 years in ethical investing in the UK, for example. And uh, we manage over 200 billion in responsible investing strategies, all the way from exclusion, all the way to engagement, active ownership, impact investing, etc. So today... If, if, if a plan sponsor does a due diligence uh, with an asset manager, every asset manager would say, yeah, we, 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 are, we we've been ESG we friendly. We are ESG we friendly. We just didn't know about it. And we do it. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody claims it now. Sure. But um, as we all know, as we all know, it is only a very few managers that, that are really ahead of that. And those managers are typically in, 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 in Northern Europe is my, is my perspective. And I know that some managers will be upset by me saying that, but that is my, my experience looking at, uh, at this topic. And, and what I mean with that is it needs to be integrated in your DNA, and it is not just saying it. Sure. Integration, but also resources, skills, tools, data? Absolutely. So, for example, we have a dedicated uh, responsible investing team of 14 people. Okay. These people have climate change PhDs and are focused on all kinds of uh, social and environmental issues every day. And they work very closely with our investment teams. And they work, for example, with our credit research analyst team to make sure e the ESNG factors are integrated in our credit research work. Clear. So basically what you're telling me here is that ESG credibility today resides in more investments, more resources, and, uh, and that's, you know, that, that is leading me to, to a question is, you know, because of the cost pressure that, you, that we've described, the margin pressure in, in the industry, you know, at the end of the day, how do you make this profitable? And, that, you know, that's a question that a lot of asset management CEOs are raising. Yeah, so, so how do you make this profitable? That is by uh, convincing your clients that you do this right and that this is not window dressing. Eh? And, and if we have clients come for on-sites with us and they talk with our portfolio managers and they talk about how they implement ESG in their portfolios, they talk with our credit research analysts and they talk about how they do it in their mm -hmm. analysis when they talk with CFOs of, of their firms, that's how you um, get credibility versus we spoke about active versus passive. The, sure. uh, yeah. passive, uh, passive players, they buy off-the-shelf data sources. They don't have proprietary teams. They don't have proprietary uh, integration in, in their investments. It's not possible with, with passive management. So this is a huge advantage in active, and, and we see more and more demand for this. And, 
if ultimately the flows need to be there to make it profitable. Well, that's course. the point, right? <laughs> and, and as you, you said earlier, 50% of the assets is already there, but we see it, uh, we, we see tremendous uh, increase in demand for, for, for this in Europe. In Europe, yes, absolutely. Yeah. No doubt about it. So, yes, the flows. However, are you able to manage price increases because you have a sustainability, stra sustainability strategy underpinning you know, an equity strategy or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah so I'm not convinced that, um, that you need to increase your price to sell your ESG or sustainable product. If we can attract more clients and more assets, it will pay for it because it's a scale game, right? Mm -hmm. And if in, an, in a non-ESG strategy, if we can raise 500 million, but in an ESG strategy, you can raise a billion or two billion, it, then it will pay for those incremental costs that we make. And we believe in it, and that's why we do it. Clear. Yeah. Um, we've mentioned the European market, of course, and as I said in the introduction, you've spent a lot of your time in the US. Um, what is your take? Do you, do you, and I think it's fair to say that in some respect, the US market's lagging behind Europe in, in, in the adoption of, of sustainability. Uh, do you think it will catch up at some point? W what is your perspective on this? Yeah, so it's very hard to, to judge on this hey, because we're going to generalize a little bit. But let's do it, right? Because there is a difference between Europe and the US. And um, I, I would say uh, it's a cultural difference that you read in the newspapers about everything be between the two continents. And uh, I think in Europe, it's a more holistic approach that people take to this. It's more a stakeholder approach. It's mm -hmm. looking at, at, at the financial and the profit results, but also at behavior and culture and, 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 and satisfying all stakeholders involved. Where in the US, it's a more puristic uh, approach to, to, to this topic, where there is probably more focus on short-term profits and, and, and results. Mm. And um, yeah, that, that, is, that is a big difference. But the question behind the question is the following is, do you think that by being very credible in sustainability, by having resources, research, that at some point is giving you or will give you a competitive advantage in the US market? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because I do believe that the US will catch up. And you see that already mm. with university endowments. Huh? You see okay. students protesting that they want their endowment to invest in ESG strategies. Foundations in the US are already here. The state of California is a front runner. Huh? It's almost like Northern Europe <laughs> uh, with Kelpers okay. and Kelsters and, uh, and other investors. So there is trends in the US, uh, teachers' pension plans. The teachers don't want to invest in, uh, in tobacco or, or, or other things. The, the, the trend is coming. And uh, as you know, we have a very large uh, uh, operation in the United States yes, under the Aegon Transamerica name. Mm -hmm. And only this year we launched three uh, ESG and sustainable products uh, on, on that platform. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, you, if, if we look at the US though, um, it's, it's, I guess you, you are expecting uh, <laughs> the, the election results <laughs> very soon. Uh, with great interest because uh, it seems that regulatory uh, regulation, sorry, is not necessarily in favor of sustainable investing. Yeah, I was somehow surprised to see the recent uh, uh, recommendation by the Department of Labor in uh, in the U.S. Mm. that really w went against uh, ESG investment as default options in in defined contribution plans, and um, and and the opposite view in Europe. There is uh, just clearly, clearly, it, it, absolutely, it, 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 it's the opposite, right? Yeah, there is yeah. a whole uh, European sustainable finance movement, and uh, uh, and and this is this is really black and white. But as you alluded to, there will be elections in the U.S., and uh, that could change uh, the, the perception uh, for sure in in the U.S. Good. Um, about the pandemic, I was struck, um, I read a number of interviews uh, that you gave recently, and uh, in one of them you said, you know, the pandemic is not really a, a setback for us, which is uh, quite you know, a, a different message to what we hear from a number of your counterparts. Can you maybe reflect on that and, and share with, with us why you think it's not really a setback? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that the pandemic comes without challenges, right? <laughs> um, but it, 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 to a certain extent, actually, I believe the pandemic has helped us. Eh? We announced in February that we were globalizing our organization. And by having everybody online and everybody on uh, video calls. Mm. What you don't have is the water cool cooler talks in specific offices and countries that we have in the past. So what I'm hearing now from, for example, my colleagues in the Netherlands, that mm. they say, hey, I speak my colleagues in the UK and the US equally 
of as much as I do speak my colleagues in the Netherlands. Sure. And that helped us in our globalization because process. Yeah, because you're in that globalization. Yeah, path. in okay. product development, yeah, in the yeah. fixed yeah. income team okay. or in the equity team, it, um, it, it really helped us uh, be, becoming uh, f global, I think, faster than we would have otherwise uh, uh, become global. Yeah, in that respect, you uh, taking advantage of that very peculiar situation. Yeah, okay. it's, yeah. A, it's a fortunate benefit <laughs> uh, in an unfortunate situation. Unfortunate yeah. situation. Clear. Thank you, Bas, and uh, best of luck for the coming months. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.